Good morning. As I mentioned yesterday, the conference has, as we're trying to cover a whole multitude of disciplines, we have a flow. We started with, uh, with uh, technology, we moved to economics, we got into the, into, the, into the social science, and today it's going to be more of humanities and social science for the, and end up with kind of management perspective uh, for the afternoon. Uh, Esther Hargitay, who was one of our sociologists, unfortunately fell ill just uh, late last week and had to cancel. So there is an insert, don't look at the pamphlet itself, but there is an insert that describe today's schedule. Um, some of the speakers, uh, John Celebran, will get a little more time to talk to us, and the breaks are going to be a little uh, longer. We'll, we'll end up at the, about the same time. The, 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 if you made some plans and leaving, you're not leaving early, you're leaving at the same time. Um, okay, any other announcement, uh, boss? No, okay. So let me introduce Don Morrison, who is a philosopher at Rice, and he will chair the morning session. Good morning. Um, I'll uh, introduce briefly each of our three speakers uh, separately. Um, with Professor Bailey's talk yesterday afternoon, uh, we began the contribution that the human sciences can make to our topic. Technological advances and economic efficiency are not the only factors that determine change. Cultural preferences, forms of social organization, and legal and regulatory structures all play an important role. Computer scientists and engineers have an intimate knowledge of their research areas and a sense of where the arc of, pro arc of progress is headed in, in coming decades. Historians have a more distant perspective and look at larger patterns that, to a degree, are rep repeatable over time. Is technological innovation a natural kind about which historical generalizations can be made? We will hear something about that this morning from Professor Mokir. Uh, he is the Robert Strauss Professor of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Economics and History at Northwestern University and Sackler Professor at Tel Aviv University. Um, I give you Professor Mokir. Thank you very much. I'd like to <clears throat> thank Moshe Vardi and his very competent staff for organizing such a fantastic conference. I had a total ball yesterday and, and learned a lot. And I'm going to take you now a little bit back in time. But before I do so, uh, uh, yeah, right. I should like to start with sort of a, a private debate I'm having with my uh, you know, uh, esteemed but misguided Northwestern colleague, uh, <laughs> Robert Gordon. Uh, you've probably all seen, you know, copies of his reviews. He's been all over the television and he's been, you know, uh, reviewed in every, every uh, newspaper and magazine in the country. And basically, Bob, but he's not alone, by the way. There's a whole sort of, you know, bunch of people who, who feel the same way. And basically, the argument is that the low hanging fruits of invention have all been picked. And you know, he gives a long list of things that we've already invented in his book, and it's a fantastic summary. So, you know, it's, it's antibiotics and, 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 you know, running water and electricity and telephones and things like that. Yeah, but all right, so these things have already been invented. They can't be invented again. And so, obviously, this process is going to slow down. And so then he makes an economic prediction, basically saying that we're facing these economic headwinds and uh, because technological progress it's not going to be as powerful as it was in the past. Annual GDP growth, as another measure of economic performance, will slow down uh, to a trickle. Now, I'd like to point out that there really are two kinds of pessimists. Um, there are the pessimists like Bob who say, oh, technological change is basically going to slow down to a trickle. And then, of course, there are people, many of them were talked about yesterday, who sort of uh, predict some kind of uh, technological dystopia in which technological progress will be so fast that, you know, essentially as workers, you know, people will become redundant because everything will be done uh, by machinery. 
So the good news is they can't both be right. The better news is they can both be wrong. And that is, in fact, the argument that I plan to make. So this it will be a rather optimistic and upbeat message, at least as far as technology is concerned. Now, I want to start off by, and I am I do, I'm sort of a part-time historian, we have been here before. So here's a quote from one of my favorite English historians, although he's always considered to be a Whig historian, whatever that means. Uh, but this is written in, in 1830, this is by Thomas Piccoli, and he basically says that in every age, everybody knows that up to his own time, progressive improvements have been taking place, but nobody seems to reckon that any improvement in the next generation, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, you can read this yourself, on what principle is it, he said, that with nothing but improvement behind us, we are to expect nothing but deterioration before us. This is writing this in 1830, which is kind of an interesting year, because that is exactly the year, first year in which the first you know, steam-driven locomotives ran between Liverpool and Manchester, and I'm sure the Bob Gordons of his day basically were, oh, this is gonna, not going to amount to anything, this machine makes too much noise, it's too slow, it breaks down, it's blah, blah, blah. So too expensive, this is never going to go anywhere. And of course, that turned out to be uh, rather mistaken. So in contrast to my learned colleague, my bottom line on the foreseeable future of technological progress, innovation is very simple and can be summarized as follows. You ain't seen nothing yet. That's my view. Now, can I be sure? Well, you know, it says in the Talmud that ever since our second temple was destroyed, the art of prophecy was given to the fools, right? So, sounds better in Hebrew. <laughs> sounds better in Hebrew, trust me. Uh, so, I can't be sure. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at a few factors that made some societies technologically successful in their past, and if, and that's a big if, the patterns or the models of the past hold up, uh, then we can see that these conditions hold with even greater force today. And if they do, then the outlook for innovation looks very rosy. That doesn't mean we can do, hum, hum, the human uh, uh, race can screw up in, in a hundred ways, and I'm not going to list all of them because we all know what they are, but at least as far as technology is concerned, I think people like Gordon are just wrong. So I want to start off by, a, it's a very elementary point, which I'm sure all of you have figured out a long time ago, and that is trying to lay down some kind of connection between technology and science, or I, I have referred to technology as prescriptive knowledge and science as propositional knowledge, but basically it's sort of knowledge of how, that is to say, technology and knowledge of what, which is science. That's a bit quick, but I'll leave it at that. And one of the things that was pointed out by my late friend Nathan Rosenberg, one of the great technological historians of our 20th century, was that one of the things that makes science advance is having better tools. So in that sense, since we know that, of course, to, to develop better technology, we need some kind of scientific breakthrough. At the same time, however, technology strengthens science by placing better instruments and tools at the disposal of scientists. So, and you can see that that provides some kind of positive feedback mechanism, and that could easily lead to some kind of explosive or a catalytic dynamic. So what this means in reality is something like that. You start off by some kind of instrument or some kind of tool. That leads to some scientific insight, say X. Scientific insight X then leads to a different technique, and that leads to a different scientific insight, and blah, 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 and on and on and on. And that process can go on essentially uh, forever. And to give you sort of an historical illustration of that, I've, uh, let me say something about this great scientific revolution of the 17th century, which is, of course, is how much of modern science uh, started, despite the fact that everything about it is, in, of course, is in controversial. But one of the things that is not, I think, controversial is that it depended to a great extent on the new tools and instruments that artisans, essentially, you know, people who make things, uh, 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 created. So here are two examples. You've all heard of and seen. Uh, this is a, not the original, I'm afraid, but a replica of Galileo's telescope. And this is sort of a Robert Hooke's microscope, by which he sort of glanced at drops of water and discovered living things were in it. These were two tools that didn't exist in 1600. They exist in 1660, and they lead to major advances in uh, science, which are, of course, uh, 
very well known. Here's something that's also well known, but maybe not quite as well known. This is Robert Boyle's famous air pump. And uh, this was built in the late 1650s. It's not the very first air pump built, but it's one of the more sophisticated ones. And he and others showed that contra Aristotle, uh, nature does not abhor a vacuum. You can actually create a vacuum. Now, we know what that technique led to because the concept of a vacuum paired to another concept which came out of a different development, uh, which is the existence of an atmosphere, led to the first atmospheric engines in the late 17th and early 18th century, from which came essentially the whole concept of an engine by which we convert heat into, in, into motion, and which is one of the foundations of our uh, modern technological society. Now, you know, we can make these examples as many as I want. I, I just pick one or two of them that I particularly like. One of the top techniques in the 20th century uh, is the development of X-ray crystallography, which has led to more than uh, 20 Nobel Prizes. The, ma the man on the left, Max von Lau, is the math physical, uh, mathematical physicist who developed the foundation. And the man to the right is William Henry Braggerford, who built the first specimen, who is also distinguished by his uncanny resemblance to John Cleese, <laughs> which you will all appreciate. But uh, now, what this led to is, of course, the most famous of these crystallography uh, 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 tools is, of course, Rosalind Franklin's 1953 use of it to discover the structure of DNA, which, to the everlasting uh, shame of the Swedish Academy, did not lead in her getting a Nobel Prize. The two guys who did it, was, but that's a different story. But this is the work on which it all depended, and this is basically a technique applied to a scientific issue. So what about today? And so, you know, this is not going to be a surprise, but Galileo never had this. This is an extremely large telescope deploying lasers for adaptive optics. So I like this because adaptive optics is a nice way in which we combine two different tools, of course, high-powered computers and telescopes. And here's what it can do. And here are two pictures of the uh, planet Uranus, the left one taken by a standard telescope, and the right one correcting the same image using uh, adaptive uh, algorithms. And you can see how much sharper that is. Now, if that isn't good enough for you, this is, of course, which Galileo wouldn't have really have dreamed about. You will all recognize this, of course, as the James Webb Space Telescope, which is planned for 2018, you know, God willing. Um, but that it will be a, you know, a dictator, the kind of thing that 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 will turn astronomy upside down. Same is true for if you look at very small things. So Louis Pasteur never dreamed of this. This is a Betsy Hell type of stimulant emission depletion microscope for which the inventors, of course, got the Nobel Prize. Rarely do they give the Nobel Prize for somebody building an instrument, but this one deserves it because, of course, what it does it it makes. Uh, nanotechnology possible, this and, 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 and similar machines. Uh, now these are the tools that are available to uh, modern scientists. But you know, it's not just that kind, those kind of tools. We have, and this is sort of an interesting, this is something that you know, these people in the 17th century had microscope and telescope, although they were not nearly as good. We have things that they wouldn't even have imagined, like lasers. Now lasers, uh, uh, it's one of the most powerful scientific tools. Of course, it has a thousand uses in daily life, you know, from playing your music to, you know, doing cataract surgery. But it also is an incredible scientific tool, including, of course, the ultimate <laughs> holy grail of science, which is proving the existence of gravitational waves, which they just did last year. But there is so much else, you know, uh, breakdown spectroscopy, uh, laser ablation, and the ultimate holy grail of all scientific research, of course, which is nuclear fusion, in which lasers are being used uh, 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 very heavily. So this is a photograph at here at, at Northwestern, actually, at our Center for Quantum Devices of a self-contained prototype quantum cascade laser, which can do tru truly amazing things, uh, for, especially in, 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 in biochemistry. Now, of course, the, the other tool, which I haven't yet mentioned it, because this is a conference in which people I've been talking about digital technology uh, so much, is, of course, uh, computers. So computers do what we do, which is they compute, only they do it so much faster that, you know, uh, and I don't have to elaborate on that, we all, uh, we all know this. But they do other things. They also store and analyze 
you know, large databases, you know, they can find nanoscopic needles, you know, in haystacks the size of Montana in a fraction of a second now. So we don't longer deal with big data. Big data is so, you know, 2000s. We have mega data, you know, mm, whatever. Uh, but we have entirely new, new fields that just couldn't exist without computers. We have computational fields, computational chemistry, computational biology, computational physics, on and on and on. These have opened new horizon, not just in digital technology, but in material science, in the uh, dynamics of turbulence. Turbulence is sort of an interesting problem because the turbulence, as, as we know the sort of partial uh, differential equations that guide turbulence since the 19th century. These are the famous Navier-Stokes equations. The only problem is we can't solve them. They can't solve them. They can only be simulated, and they're extreme, extremely powerful computers to simulate them even at a very small, at a very small uh, scale. But now, I think we're getting better at this <laughs> every year. And you know, once we solve these turbulence equations, you know, that will be major, major importance to half a dozen applications we can all think of. Uh, the advent of quantum computing also, it's still just getting started, I think, is in that area in particular, will be parti is particularly and promising. And so, what I think, well, so Bob Gordon talks a great deal about the importance of computers, but he tends to assess their uh, computers on, on productivity directly. What he forgets is the indirect impact of computers on output via their effect on research and scientific effort. And that, I think, is in the long term will be much more important. So we have a whole new discipline as well called data science, and they create new paradigms. I mean, I don't do this, but I just listened to a lecture of a lady in, 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 in Rome talking about this. And you know, this is actually a fully full-fledged science now, which creates a new culture in which people basically look for empirical regularities and patterns in very large data sets, the kind of thing that you just couldn't do in the past when you didn't have these uh, powerful computers. So we have all kind of data-driven innovation, of course, uh, including things like Uber and Airbnb, but also precision medicines, anything that has omics behind it, basically depends on computers, so proteomics, uh, lipidomics, genomics, all those things depend very heavily on extremely powerful uh, computers, and then we, you know, we do all kind of other ways of, of extracting information that just couldn't be done without computers. But it, it would be a mistake to just think that the technological revolution of our age is uh, just digital, uh, because we have actually developed in whole areas which are, which are different, uh, new things uh, that are, and in the long run, may prove as important as the digital Revolution. The one that I, of course, we, everybody's talking about is the sort of new gene drive uh, revolution or the sort of CRISPR CAS9 techniques by which we can now no longer take genes from one organism and transport them to another organism, which is we've been doing that for 15 or 20 years, but we're now actually able to edit and manipulate any kind of gene sequence within uh, a single organism, and that's a vast step. Uh, forward, so we can, and we will be able to, and this is not my prediction, this is the prediction of people who work in the area, within 15 or 20 years, we will be able uh, to design plants and animals to meet our specifications, and of course, hopefully, to cope with the big problem, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, which is a changing climate. Um, now, you know, this is playing God on a very large scale. Now, we have been playing God, ladies and gentlemen, for thousands of years. God did not create poodles. We did. <laughs> uh, and so, but we did it in a very slow, difficult process, whereas this new technique will allow us to create new species and plants, you know, not entirely new, but manipulate their characteristics so that they can cope with the new parameters of the world. And so, you know, these techniques are all on the horizon or already being experimented with. I think in the next 15 or 20 years, they will dominate the scene as much as the robots we heard so much about uh, yesterday. And they, to be quite fair, they scare a lot of smart people because they will have intended and many unintended, unexpected consequences, including, of course, their effect on the nature of work, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. 
Now, let me say something about institutions. So, you know, in economics, we have gone through what you may call an institutional revolution over the last so 20, 30 years, thanks to the uh, influence of my, my dear friend, the late Douglas North. And uh, clearly, they mattered a great deal in generating uh, technological progress. So here I may abuse the hospitality of our, of, our host, of our host and shamelessly put in a plug for my new work, which just came out last, last month. Uh, and this is a book that deals to some extent with the impact of institutions on technological progress in the sort of uh, 1500 to 1700 uh, era. And I want to draw a few conclusions from that book and apply them today. So what I argue in that book, among other things, is that some institutional environments support innovation more than others. And as I see it, this, there's two things that really matter a lot. One is that the system needs to incentivize and reward scientific and intellectual innovators. That's not easy to do because knowledge, as we all know, is actually hard to make proprietary, right? I cannot own this talk I'm giving to you now because you can also take notes and then you know, do with it anything you want. Um, and so the system has to design a way in which we incentivize intellectual innovators to do this, even so they will never be able effectively to exclude people from uh, their knowledge. So even so, it, you may think of it as their property, but it's sort of a property uh, with this flaw, which of course economists, economists have known about for a very long time. Uh, now we need something more because we also need a system in which innovators not only are rewarded, but they're not penalized. They're not accused of being heretics and apostates and you know, black magicians and you know every every culture has these terms in which they don't look at they look at innovators and they say you know, this guy is a heretic you know and and you know the period I, the book is about the 1500 to 1700 period is of course a period in which we we all know about the famous persecutions of you know, Galileo's trial being the most famous one but in fact, there were much, many worse cases. You think about Giordano Bruno being burned in 1600 in central Rome and on and on, okay? So those, we need that, those kind of institutions. We also need, and I, uh, I really believe this, we need what I call a competitive and free market for ideas in which both the demand and the supply sides are heavily fragmented so that no single entity has enough market power to protect incumbencies and to uh, prevent what we call contestability. So basically, if the market is sufficiently competitive, there are all kind of crackpots running around with crazy theories, 99 of whom will be forgotten, but one, one will revolutionize some way of thinking, and you don't know which one, so you need to give everybody uh, a chance. You need to give people uh, the, the opportunity to express themselves, to move around as they want and locate where they want and pick the occupations that they want. Now, what I argue in the book is basically that what accounts for Europe's success is that these two conditions were uh, met to an ever-increasing extent in early modern Europe, roughly between, say, the Columbus discovery of America and the death of Isaac Newton in 1727. And that is the society that gave us innovators of the kind of James Watt and Adam Smith, Lavoisier, Euler, Volta, Beethoven, you can go on in every area and find your innovators. But that, this is the society that created that. So then the question is, once more, to what extent are these conditions true today? And so what I would say is, despite the fact that I, you know, like everybody else, like to quetch and gripe, um, the world today actually provides unprecedented incentives for successful intellectual innovators. Okay? First, you know, we provide them with financial security or tenure, if you want, in universities and in research institutions. We give them, you know, most things we get named chairs, we give them research accounts, we give them all kinds of goodies. Then there are a bunch of prizes, not necessarily financial, so some of them do, of course. You know, prizes and awards from the Nobel Prize down all the way to smaller recognitions such as memberships in honor academies, honorary degrees, book prizes, art best prize for the best article, prize for the best book review. Yeah, I mean, we give, you know, every journal has these endless prizes. And they are there too because it's a cheap way 
of incentivizing innovators to do their work, even so there no, may no money changing hand. Then, of course, there is, for at least a few of them, name recognition and fame through mass media. I mean, Bob Gordon is a good example of that. I mean, he's sold something like 60,000 books so far. I mean, it ain't bad, but he's getting, you know, he, people know who he is, right? Everybody in the room knew who he was when I mentioned him. And for few, very few, but so, there are actually financial, large financial rewards through consulting contracts, you know, patents, successful startups, and blah, blah, blah. So most of these institutions I, I show in the book uh, came into being between 1500 and 1700, but they were puny compared to what we have today. So we are, it's not like we're not incentivizing people uh, to innovate. And so how competitive is the market for ideas today? You know, there's, I have concerns, like everybody else in this room, but the international market for successful scientists and, uh, you know, uh, potentially innovative personnel is still enormously uh, competitive. And in large part, that is because the United States, at least so far, <laughs> has had a more or less open-door policy for foreign inventors through this H-1B visa problem that now seem to be in some doubt, but let's all hope and pray that uh, you know, what we're being threatened with is not going to go through. Um, of the workers in computers and mathematical fields in Silicon Valley, 67% were born outside the United States, and immigrants have started more than half of the 87 so-called uh, unicorn companies that value them more, more, more than uh, 1 billion. And so you look at the list of people in top universities, top hospitals, cutting-edge firms, including the program for this conference, I might add, you see a lot of foreign names, and that is the way it should be. Moreover, you know, the world is still politically fragmented and competitive. And this is important because the market for ideas is healthy and, uh, and uh, it's probably indispensable for it to be competitive. Now, I hasten to add that I cannot take credit for this idea. Here's a quote from Edward Gibbon, the last chapter of Gibbon's uh, decline and fall. And it always reflects on the situation in Europe at the time. Now, I'm not going to argue with each of those statements, but he points out, if you look at the piece, the section in bold, okay, he says basically, in peace and the progress of knowledge and industry is accelerated by the emulation. Emulation is an 18th century word, meaning essentially competition uh, of so many active rivals. In war, the European forces are exercised by temperate and undecisive contests. Well, 1789 was a bad year to make that point, I guess. But, uh, uh, but basically, the idea that Europe is divided in these 12 powerful and equal kingdoms and all these other things. And he says that's basically why we are successful. Now you can find similar statements in the great philosophers, David Hume, Immanuel Kant. Sort of enlightenment people got this. Um, some people today don't. Uh, so what does this mo model pr predict for today? Again, the world is more pluralistic and competitive than ever. Globalization has not meant some kind of you know, global entity that rules everything, and maybe that's good or bad, I don't know, but that's how it is. There are basically five or six major blocks, uh, North America, uh, China, uh, the, I would have said the EU, but maybe North America should now be the Anglo-Saxon world and the EU would be just a continent, but you know, that hardly matters. Um, and so, you know, the, and these compete with each other really hard. And uh, all these participants basically realize that they have to keep up with best practice science and technology or else they'll fall hopelessly behind. So everybody's really obsessed by these STEM education, these PISA scores, uh, global IP intellectual property rights, things like that, because they're afraid of falling behind. You know, maybe one day there will be new blocks emerging, Africa, the Middle East, looks remote, but who knows? So there. What this also means, and uh, that it will be very difficult for any single nation um, that is reluctant to adopt a uh, particular technique or uh, trying to suppress it, uh, to do so. Simpl and that came up yesterday uh, in Diane's talk when somebody said, well, what if we do it and the rest of the world doesn't? And in fact, that is precisely what was happening uh, in Europe uh, before and during the Industrial Revolution, but it is also true uh, today. In a competitive, fragmented world, no single polity can suppress uh, innovation, 
And if they resist it, then they will simply be developed uh, somewhere else. Now, whether that's the good news or the bad news, I can tell you, but that is the way it is. And you know, recently, there's been China has made an about face on GMO crops. For a long time, they were violently opposed to it, much like the Europeans were. And the last year, they have turned around and said, no, this is actually really working well. We're going to start this on a large scale. You can think of it what you want, but that's how it is. And so what is true to today, I think, is that as long as scientific and technological advances happen anywhere, they happen everywhere. And so technologically reactionary policies or, or cautionary policies, depending on your point of view, may not be effective. Um, and that was, I think, true in the past as well. It was a big difference that in the past, when some country invented something, it took a generation, maybe more, for it to disseminate elsewhere. Today, it's instantaneous. All right. A third consideration about the past, which I want to apply to the world today, and here I'm going to rely again on a concept developed by uh, my friend Nathan Rothenberg, on, uh, which is the concept of focusing devices. So science and technology tend to advance most rapidly when the world, or at least the society in which these people live, poses them with a well-defined problem that needs urgent solution. And then everybody focuses on that, trying to solve that problem. Now, uh, and when it's realized that this is, will be really enhance social welfare. Uh, now, of course, they, you know, it has to be within the capability of the society to, to solve it. But if it is, they will focus their efforts on it. So you look at the 18th century Britain, just as an example. They faced five major bottlenecks that they needed to solve. And here they are all listed. They had to pump water out of coal mines. <laughs> it may sound, sound mundane, but let me tell you, that was a big deal. They have to learn how to, learn how to spin quality cotton uh, inexpensively without the use of human fingers. They had to turn pig iron into wrought iron. They had to somehow find a cure for the most serious uh, uh, epidemic of the 18th century, which is smallpox. And finally, they had to solve the problem of longitude at sea, which had been bedeviling sailors for, for, for centuries. And eight, by 1815, all five of those problems had been solved. Now, you know, uh, they couldn't do other things that perhaps they would like to do. They couldn't build submarines or airplanes. They couldn't tame and harness electricity. They couldn't even actually figure out how to make a cheap steel. These were problems that were just too difficult for them. And so it took time until these things happened. And uh, now, this kind of focusing devices is true, I think, through much of modern history. Uh, you look at the 20th century, and I could give you, you know, 100 examples. The best known are probably the uh, famous invention of the Haber-Bosch nitrogen fixing uh, technique in the years just before World War I, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not <laughs> going to make a statement about that now. But you think about these things like the salk sabin a polio vaccine, Project Manhattan, a moon landing, you know, well-defined problems that we're going to solve. So Gordon basically claims it's, that you know, these, these breakthroughs were relatively easy and these were low-hanging fruits. But I'm not convinced, in fact, <coughs> convinced of the opposite, that they weren't, they weren't easy at the time. They seem easy to us now, but they weren't at the time. And there may be in 2200, you know, nuclear fusion and curing Alzheimer will seem easy, but they're not easy for us. Uh, so we, I have a list here, and this is completely arbitrary and based on no scientific uh, uh, work, just reading the newspapers, of what I think the most well-defined the well focusing problems are for our age today. Of course, global warming and climate change tend to the very top, but there is this sort of evil twin of global warming, which is ocean acidification, which is going to be just as bad. Related to that, but still different, is desertification and the growing scarcity of fresh water. There are issues of energy, which we all know about, um, multi-drug resistance to antibiotics. I mean, we could go on. These are well-defined problems. I sincerely believe that every single one of them is soluble with the new tools that we have are available, with the possible exception of uh, nine, where we may looking at a complexity we not haven't quite quite fully appreciated. So, you know, the latest uh, drugs on Alzheimer's have turned out to be not working. So this is something where we, it, may, it may take longer time. But most of these other things, I think, are within reach and will 
be solved. And this is not just digital progress, ladies and gentlemen. This is progress a lot across the board on many things. All right, so I'm going to spend the last few minutes on coming back to the theme of this conference and talk about the future of work and what this all means for that. So <clears throat> I think Dick and Larry yesterday talked about this, and they made the point that we've, had, we've experienced a sharp decline in our history, first of agriculture, and then later manufacturing, and the numbers are too well known to need to, in fact, in fact Moshe showed them early on, uh, and yet there's no evidence that the streets were ever filled with millions of desperate, unemployable ex-farmers and ex-factory workers that were kicked out by new technology. The only time when the streets were filled with these people were in the 1930s when the source of unemployment was not technology, but a, 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 a collapse of financial markets. Uh, and so the hard truth is that historical evidence for technologically induced long-term unemployment, despite the fact that people feared it from the early days of the Industrial Revolution, hasn't happened yet. Even so, there have been short-term disruptions, of course. But maybe this time is different. Eh? Is, that, is that a possibility? So, yeah, I mean, if I'm right, and the rate of technological progress will accelerate, it's possible that job creation may not keep up. I don't know whether that's going to happen. I'm going to make predictions on that. But I want to share two observations with you, and then I'll... The first observation has to do with the type of innovation that we're, face, that we're facing. So in the, in the economics of technological change, we distinguish between process innovation and uh, product innovation. So process innovation is essentially take, make a ton of steel or a bushel of wheat and make them with less capital and less uh, labor and possibly less land. And so you, know, you gain productivity. And so if you do this with less labor, you know, then workers may be replaced depending on bit on what happens to uh, uh, prices. Now, this could get a lot worse because artificial intelligence may replace workers who are trained in high human capital intensity, and we, you know, we talked about that. But product innovation, unless process innovation, almost always creates new jobs that nobody really imagined before. So, Take you back to 1825, the middle of the Industrial Revolution. Hundreds of thousands of these handloom weavers in England are thrown out of work because they can't compete with the factories which use a fraction of their, of their labor power. But they, you know, these impoverished handloom weavers never uh, imagined that their children, maybe not themselves, but their children would become railroad engineers and telegraph operators and you know, electrical electricians and things like that. And very similarly, in 1914, if you went to my great-grandmother and told her that, that you know, her great-grandchildren would have jobs like video game designers, you know, cybersecurity specialists, GPS programmers, uh, veterinary psychiatrists, I mean, what kind, who would imagine that these jobs would ever exist? And they exist now because of product innovation. I don't know about veterinary psychiatrists, you know, but, but, but there, you know, there we have it. And so... By 2050, we will have new products in the markets none of us can imagine, certainly not Bob Gordon, and, um, and our imaginations just fall short there. Now, you know, it's true that some jobs may be replaced, and I'm sort of finding this. Uh, uh, but, you know, e even there, I think a hardcore, I think. So, I don't know. I don't think uh, the late Antonin Scalia is likely to be replaced by a robot. Not so sure about Clarence Thomas, but that's interesting. <laughs> uh, in higher education now, we have these MOOCs that are placed, certain to replace uh, people like me. Uh, but in fact, if you look at what's happening at universities today, there's no such threat. In fact, parents are working harder and harder to get their children at schools like Rice or Northwest or North Warthmore. And the emphasis is changing. Instead of sitting in front of a large class and I, I get smaller classes, I get to interact with these students, I get to know them. I think this is an improvement. This is not a de deterioration. If we can keep that up, uh, uh, who loses? What we know with certainty, however, is the process will not be painless. It will, it will hurt. Uh, you can't, you know, human capital or labor, you know, or skills, if you want, is not malleable. You cannot take construction workers age 50 and say, sorry, you know, your job is going to be by a robot, you know, you should become, you know, an orthopedic surgeon or a dental hygienist. It doesn't work, right? I mean, that is the pain 
that Schumpeter is talking about when he's talking about creative destruction. So any kind of notion that technology equals progress is just silly because there will be a great deal of pain. It's always been like that. It will always be like that. But without it, I think our economies will stagnate and in the end will be uh, worse off. And so I am truly worried, if you want to be pessimistic, is that populist demagogues and sort of well-meaning but self righteous concerned scientists uh, will slow the process down. So I can talk about that some more if people want. Um, and so, you know, I'm, this is a you know, question, I'm not going to skip this, this slide because I'm starting to run out of time. But basically, of course, this Dick Freeman talked about this yesterday, the real question is one, at which, to what extent machines and people will be complements versus a substitute, by which we mean, if they're complements, you know, machines actually make people better, and if they're substitutes, they will replace people. And in fact, you know, I don't think anything I heard yesterday decided this for me, whether they are going to be complement and substitutes, but I tend to be more to what the sort of opt optimistic kind of view. So what we have seen, and I mean, Larry Mitchell sort of poo-pooed that, but the data, I'm afraid, are not with him on this. So, you know, uh, Larry Katz and Bob Margo have a classic paper it was published a few years ago in which they talked about the hollowing out of the labor force in which, you know, the jobs that are most replaced are the ones in the middle and the ones that seem to be most complementary with computers are the ones that are at the very end, like, you know, high skill, creativity kind of jobs or relatively uh, blue collar jobs that have uh, tasks that are just very hard to program. You know, this classic example is cleaning hotel rooms, you know, which is going to be really hard for robots to do because every hotel guest leaves, uh, leaves a different mess. Uh, so the other observation I have, and that will be my last one, and this links in I think, very nicely with the kind of things that uh, Diane Paley was talking about yesterday, and I, and again, I beg to differ a little bit from, from Larry's view. Uh, but it doesn't work whether it will go up or down, I don't know, but it will, its nature will change. Work will not be what it used to be. And let me again take you a little back, a bit back in history. Before the Industrial Revolution, basically the modal worker anywhere on this planet worked at home for themselves, whether they were farmers or artisans, but even shopkeepers and teachers, they worked from their home and they'd set their own schedule. Now, the Industrial Revolution changed that. It was Marx's genius to be the first to really see this. It created not just factories. It created the factory system in which work became tightly circumscribed in space and time, as well as subject to constant supervision and discipline by people who, to whom you were not related. That's a major shift in the social organization uh, of the economy. And so one of the things that came out of that is this idea we have of a job. There were no jobs before the Industrial Revolution, or very few of them. People didn't have jobs. People worked, but they didn't have jobs. A job is a long-term relation between an employee and an employer, and that's, that, that is really a modern innovation. My suspicion is that the idea of a job may be eroding, which is not the same as the idea of work. Uh, modern technology has made start to make dents in this system, and the pendulum may be swinging back. It may not swing back all the way, but it is swinging back. Uh, we have these independent contractors, or contingent laborers, they're called, whether they are larger or smaller than the gig economy, I'm not gonna get into. Uh, but what makes this possible is technology, because you can't imagine things like Airbnb and uh, TaskRabbit and Uber and so on without the sort of digital superstructure that, 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 that uh, carries it. And so I'm not going on record to say whether I think Uberization is a good development of a bad development. I just think it's here and it's going to get larger and larger. Uh, it will have costs and it will have benefits. But what it will give workers, and if you ever talk to an Uber driver, you know this, uh, it gives them one thing that they really want, flexibility and the control of when and where they work, which is something that the factory system took away. Now, here's the final. So what if people like Moshe Vardy and Manuela Veloso turn out to be right, and in the end, ever smarter machine in the limit will replace human labor altogether, almost altogether. So we will create some kind of a player piano. You, you may recall player piano from the first sort of dystopia, Kurt Vonnegut's first novel, I believe. 
uh, in which nobody works and everybody is kind of frustrated. I can see a world in which the only people who work are the people who want to work, not the people who have to work. And I want to keep in, to remind you that even today, about 25% of all Americans do volunteer work for which they are not paid. Um, uh, and, you know, those not in the labor force, so retirees and so on, do more of that, which is not surprising, perhaps, but even people who work for, for a living also do time volunteering. Moreover, we have always had a leisure class. Um, every society that... Well, my, uh, most of European leisure class were probably priests and landowners, uh, as, you might, as you might imagine. Uh, very few of them ever volunteered to pick up a shovel or a hoe and go and break their backs working in the fields. You know, they found things to do. The difference, I think, is between our own age and their age is that first, the number of expected leisure hours per lifespan has increased enormously. People start to work later in life. They retire earlier in life. There was no such thing as retirement really before the 20th century. And, and they work fewer hours uh, per year, about half of what they worked uh, a century ago. But what's more important, I think, is that the technology to enjoy leisure um, has improved immensely since 1945. You know, before you know, the Industrial Revolution, the only thing people spent, well, not the only thing, but the most of what, you put, what pe the rich people did was they, they played cards and they hunted. You could go to show the United States in the 19th century at this wonderful thing called eye-gouging contests, uh, Seems like a, an acquired a taste, maybe, but they had things like that. But the notion of the access that we have developed since 1945 to spectator sport, to video games, to, you know, but this is totally unprecedented and it's going to change uh, human life. I think in that dimension, virtual reality is going to revolutionize things as much or more so than television and video games. Uh, Ever did. And so let me finish by citing some of the most thoughtful words on the topic that were written more than 80 years ago, and we're many of you are probably familiar with, but this is so well done, I need to repeat this. This is John Maynard Keynes in his Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, written back in the middle of the Depression. And so he says, the increase of technical efficiency has been taking place faster than we can deal with the problem of labor absorption. And the improvement in the standard of life has been a little bit too quick. Little did he know in 1930, right? For the moment, the very rapidity of these changes is hurting us and bringing difficult problems to solve. We are aff afflicted by a new disease, namely technological employment. That actually is not documentable in 1930, but that's beside the point. But then look at the last sentence. It, this is only a temporary phase of maladjustment. All it is means that in the long run, mankind is solving its economic problem. And what he means by that is, is quite clear. Here's what he says. For the first time since his creation, man, sorry about the you know, non-gender neutral language, this is 1930, uh, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem. How to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure in which science and compound interest will have won for him to live wisely and agreeably and well. And then he says, we shall do more things for ourselves. That is usual with the rich today. Only too glad to have small duties and tasks and routines. Three hour shifts on our, or a 15 hour work week may put off the problem for a great while. For three hours a day is quite enough to satisfy the old Adam in most of us. And of course the old Adam is what he refers to the Adamite curse, which is in the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat bread. That's the old Adamite curse. We are just maybe, just maybe, on the verge of getting rid of that one. Thank you. Should I answer questions now, uh, Don? May I? 
Um, I d just, this is fantastic. I just wanted to uh, help maybe connect a few of those ideas that you had spread out. You had the maybe 10 or so global challenges. And uh, in this conference, we've talked a lot about technolo technological challenges and how they might uh, change things. What we haven't talked so much is about what you addressed in the last portion of your talk, which is the, what I call the decision-making systems themselves. That is, perhaps, for example, a market economy is not the, perhaps we could innovate the market economy. Perhaps we could innovate governance systems. Perhaps we could innovate the way we make decisions as a society in order to achieve the, what you had talked about in the last few um, slides. So uh, <coughs> all of that is just to say, that, uh, I'd like to maybe hear your thoughts on the possibilities of innovating um, decision-making systems themselves. And as a kind of a shameless plug, I would say that I have a poster in the, in the lunchroom that is on this topic, so if anybody's interested, I'm happy to talk about it. No, I mean, the question, I think, is, is, is totally pertinent. And to some extent, uh, uh, Dick Freeman talked about very similar things. Uh, the big issue will be one now of Um, a big issue comes out, you know, if really we end up in this sort of Keynesian paradise in which we have tackled the undermined curve, uh, you know, where, where's, where's income going to come from? Uh, I'm not going to say that I want to overthrow the market better, <laughs> but we need to think very seriously about how income is generated and a lot of it will be a matter of who owns what. So if the ownership of the means of production is more controlled or not, will we make more money? Then we will have to devise methods by which uh, this is taken care of. And you know, I think it was either Dick or Larry yesterday made an extremely good analogy, which I would like to reiterate. And so institution. Does natural resources make something better off? And the answer is that cannot be determined until you tell me what kind of institution. If you are in Norway or in Canada, and the vast bulk of the population benefits from this, people will work if they have to, but when they got to it. But if you are in Nigeria or in Russia or in Venezuela, And now here I'm going to throw in some, some note of pessimism. Uh, for me, that it is far from clear that we would get there. You know, my great inspiration by Douglas North Frank Colby, and I've already mentioned this repeatedly, but it's a very memorable story. So, he said, you know, not by accident, but in terms of logical progress, aging. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, uh, very exciting, and uh, you're a great speaker. I wonder, um, with the uh, top ten challenges of the current day, uh, number one, uh, climate change, I, I wonder if maybe more science isn't what's needed. There already seems to be a large scientific consensus. Like you said, it's a well-defined problem, and it seems to be a political impasse about our inability to address the problem. Uh, I wonder if that at all changes the analysis. What, how, do we, how do we wrestle with that? Thanks. If you are waiting for a political solution to the climate change problem, I have bad news for you. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. The notion, 
you know, that 180 nations will ever agree on an enforceable way of curbing fossil fuel uh, it seems to me utterly unrealistic. And I don't think there's been any sort of really remarkable progress. You know, Paris, you know, we, whether we'll stick with Paris or not, that is not going to be enough. What will be needed, and this is happening before our eyes, is that science and technology are designing the one mechanism that will assure the fact that most fossil fuels that are still in the earth will stay there, mm. and that is lower prices for renewable. And we have been, when you look at the declining price of solar panels, you look at the greater efficiencies of wind turbines, uh, you know, with or without the Obama subsidies, that technology will dominate. Uh, the same, you know, there are issues that have to be resolved. Storage is the big issue, right? So wind and uh, wind power in particular and solar power as well are not spread uniformly over the 24 hours of the day. And so, you know, we need a way of, of, of redistributing that. Those are resolvable problems. In fact, they have been resolved. The question is which is one of the most economical. There are other technological solutions that are more remote, but at least worth thinking about. You know, there is a serious literature now about geoengineering and trying to actually, you know, it's not as crazy as you think, because you look at the major eruption of a volcano, that actually leads to significant cooling. We could try to replicate that. Whether that will have unintended consequences or not, I mean, you know, one worries about these things, but it is an option that we could pursue. There have been other options that seem to be more far-fetched, like seeding uh, the oceans with little iron particles. To I mean, there are a variety of things that we are doing. Many of them are still experimental. The one thing that will work is cheaper renewables. And we're moving in that direction full steam. And once that's happened, subsidies, schmupsidies. You know, <laughs> we will get there. Sure. Um, okay, we uh, don't have time for any more questions. Let's thank our speaker.